Greetings, this is Greg, P47, Part 1 Alpha. I need to talk about the throttle and turbo control on the P47 Thunderbolt. I should have covered this in Part 1, but I didn't. And recent simulator developments have prompted me to get this information out now, rather than incorporate it into a bigger video later. This will be quick, but it's important. In Part 1, we talked about the importance of positioning the various cooling flaps and shutters for maximum performance. But of even greater importance is the relationship of the throttle and boost levers. Now I have no idea if this is factored into the latest simulators, but either way I feel I need to cover it. So let's start. Here is the throttle quadrant from a P47. There are various types, but for our discussion they're all the same in practical terms. For the sake of being complete, I will briefly go over all four of the levers here. Closest to us with the M label on the knob is the mixture control. There are four positions. Idle cutoff is used to shut down the engine. Auto lean is used for fuel economy when cruising. Auto rich is for maximum power and it's the setting you'll use anytime you might or do need maximum performance. Full rich is protected by a stop wire and will never be used unless auto rich is malfunctioning. Full rich is not present on the throttle quadrant on November models. For purposes of this discussion, we're putting the mixture to full rich and leaving it there. The next lever away from us is labeled P for propeller control. On the side panel, assuming you have a Curtis electric propeller, put that switch into auto. Now the propeller lever will regulate engine RPM within certain limits. For maximum power, we want it all the way forward. It only comes back to reduce fuel consumption, noise, and wear and tear on the engine. The way it works is pretty simple. Full forward gives you maximum RPM, meaning that as you advance the throttle from idle, the engine RPM will accelerate towards redline. Once it reaches redline, the propeller pitch will increase to prevent it from going any faster and effectively harness the power from the engine. When you pull the throttle back, pitch will decrease. This is called a constant speed propeller. It varies the pitch to maintain the selected engine RPM. So for our purposes right now, we're leaving it full forward. Max RPM, max power. Next is the throttle. It's exactly like the throttle in just about every other World War II airplane. Farthest away, we have the turbocharger boost control. Some people call it the boost lever, some the turbo lever. This controls the speed of the turbocharger. For now, let's leave it all the way back. On takeoff, as seen in this image here, you'll be in auto rich, prop full forward, turbo lever all the way back, and you will advance the throttle until you have the desired manifold pressure, probably about 52 inches. There may be some cases when you use a little extra manifold pressure from the turbo on takeoff, but it's going to be rare. In part one, you can clearly see that when taking off from an aircraft carrier, at least one of the four pilots did use the turbo. As the aircraft climbs, uh, you may want to use the throttle. Well, you do want to use the throttle to set manifold pressure. However, as soon as the throttle is all the way forward and you find yourself needing more manifold pressure, that's always going to happen uh, 12,000 feet, right around there, you'll need to move the turbo lever forward. So. When moving levers forward to increase power, it's throttle first and then turbo lever. When pulling power back, it's the turbo lever first, moving backwards, and then the throttle. The turbo lever should never be forward of the throttle, and that's pretty important. As you climb, you'll need to advance the boost lever more and more to maintain manifold pressure. Now at some point, you'll reach the turbocharger's maximum speed, which is usually 18,250 RPM in most B, C, and D models, or 22,000 for the later planes. Early models have a turbo speed light, the use of which is confusing. It's on at engine start and then will blink until the turbo starts boosting. Once it's over speeding, it stops blinking and just stays on as it was before you were using turbo boost. It's a confusing light. Thankfully, the later planes just have a gauge, I think that's much better, and the planes with a gauge also have an overspeed light. That should be self-explanatory. Now, one problem here is that in the heat of combat, you might not want to move those levers separately. It can be a bit inconvenient when you're fighting a 109, so a lot of pilots would just grab both the throttle and boost levers and move them together. 
that's acceptable and doesn't violate the principle of never having the boost lever ahead of the throttle. Republic aircraft recognized this, and on the P-47C, as in Charlie, and later models, the throttle and boost lever can be connected, so that movement of one will move the other. This should only be engaged above 7,000 feet. Now here's the problem. If you move both levers together, it costs you about 300 horsepower, which is easily enough to make the difference between winning and losing a fight. A lot of these planes are really pretty close in performance, and a 300 horsepower hit is a big deal. At times, trading horsepower for the convenience is worth doing, which is why you can connect the two levers. But at other times, you might need that last 300 horsepower. The reason for the 300 horsepower difference is pretty simple. If you watch part one of this series, you should understand that the P-47 has a gear-driven supercharger and an exhaust-driven turbo supercharger. That engine-driven supercharger uses power to spin it whether you use its boost or not. So you want to use it to the maximum extent possible since you're paying for it in drive requirements anyway. If you advance the turbo lever before you have all the manifold pressure you can use from the supercharger via the throttle, you're paying to drive two superchargers, but with a manifold pressure value that one alone could deliver. So if you do move both levers together, that's fine, but remember a few things. Don't do it below 7,000 feet, except in an emergency. That's straight out of the manual. Don't do it if you're running from an enemy and need all the speed you can get. And as a general rule, the higher you are in altitude, the less the resulting power loss will be. Now, I don't know if this is factored into modern simulators. Maybe it is or isn't. Even if it isn't, maybe it will be soon. Developers create new models and updates all the time. This can be easily tested. Set up your P-47 and cruise at 15,000 feet and run it up to 52 inches of manifold pressure by advancing both levers together. Note the highest speed the plane reaches in level flight, then repeat the procedure by advancing the throttle first until it reaches its limit, and then add boost from the turbo until you get to 52 inches. If the simulator is really accurate, this should result in a higher speed. One last thing, the November models, with the exception of some early ones, don't have this issue. They have a feature that allows you to move the levers together, and the system will automatically position the throttle and waste gates for optimal power. But Again, that's only some of the P-47N as in November models. All the other ones uh, have a 300 power loss or approximately 300 horsepower loss if you'd simply move the levers together. As always, thanks for watching. Have a great day.